Uh, time to welcome in, as we do every month, Ag Commissioner Mike Strain. Dr. Strain, good morning. How are you, sir? And I am doing well. How are you? Doing very well. Doing really good. well. Well, we just got some rain. We real hard. I heard the thunder out there. It's the forecast for this time has been uh it's been kind of all over the place. So Well, that's uh, the good thing about being a weatherman, right? Right. Yeah, you only gotta be able to right. It's either gonna rain or shine, right? Yeah. So fifty percent of the time you you're pretty accurate. Right. But one hundred percent of the time the viewers are gonna be mad at you. So oh, well, you know that's all. Well, oh, that's not plugged in. Let's hang on one second. Let's get you all plugged in. There you go. Got it. All right. So we got a lot to talk about. Uh, the, we'll get to the cost of eggs in a minute because that's trending nationally. But I got to start uh, at home with the sugar cane crop. Um, so we'll be finished harvesting cane. Most of the mills will close within the next week. So normally well, they were you know, aiming for January the 20th. The good news is prior to the freeze that we had on the 23rd, 24th, uh, when it got so cold, uh, we were at you know more than 90% harvested, probably 92 93%. And the sugar cane, the harvest goes continuously. You harvest every day. And at the end of the day, there will be some cane that's not harvested left in the field. Because okay. what happened, as soon as it, we had the freeze, it immediately warmed up. You know, normally when you have freezing temperatures, it will stay cool, stay below 55 or, you know, in the, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And what happens if it warms back up, then within about 10 days, you've got about a 10-day window, the cane really starts, it starts fermenting. And you lose sugar quality, and so if you've seen, if you've passed by some of those cane trucks, you know you kind of smell that little ferment going on. That's from the sugar fermenting. But I think at the end of the day, we will, you know, probably get about ninety-five to ninety-eight percent of the cane in. So that's a good thing. That is a good. Thing. The really good news is that according to the LSU Ag Center studies, and they monitor the soil temperature, it didn't get cold enough to damage the root system of the plant. That's a big deal because you know cane when you plant it, it's there for five years. It's okay. a five-year plant, All right. you know, and so, you, you know, the first year you harvest, and that's for the plant cane. In other words, the first year when you plant the cane, the first year you harvest it, that's for next year's planting. And so you have fields in rotation. Then you have your, oh, you know, your, your second year, third year, and fourth year stubble. That is for sugar. And some of the other exciting things going on in cane is LSU Ag Center has developed a sugar cane variety that between years two, three, and four, the sugar content doesn't really decline a lot. That was a big deal because you have your highest harvestable sugar generally in that second year stubble. Okay. And so then in year three and year four, by year four, the sugar's going down in that field to then in the next year, you know, that's the one that's plowed under, left fallow, and then planted. So everything's in rotation. But the new varieties maintain their sugar through years two, three, and four, and that's exciting because, again, that adds to the bottom line. There's no more cost involved, right? Right, But there's profit involved and increased sugar, increased yield. And that's one of the great things about the LSU Ag Center. And the Audubon Research Center, supported uh, by both your tax dollars, federal dollars, and the farmers themselves, the farmers put up a voluntary assessment that goes into research, is that the new cane varieties, and the cane variety will last about 8 to 10 years, but the new cane varieties are distributed free back to the farmers, and they grow, that, they propagate that out. And so, and, and if you look at this new variety, they go back in, in the research and they have the old varieties, they have that, you know, in, in storage where they, they keep continue to propagate it and save it. They were able to take some, some really good older varieties and rebreed those with some of the new varieties and come up with this new plant that is exceptional. And that's kind of the research that's ongoing that uh, is kind of behind the scenes. But if you look at R&D in Louisiana, you know, we're one of the premier states uh, through our ag centers and our universities that do research and development on agricultural plants. And that's what keeps us ahead of the curve. It's mm -hmm. supported by the farmers. Almost every commodity, the farmers voluntarily put up money to continue research and development in return for having those, those wonderful plants. I assume that if you have a new variety of sugar cane, it's to increase yield. Uh, not necessarily. Yield is good. good. We like yield. Yeah. But it can also be uh, for cold tolerance. That's one of the things we're looking at, disease resistance. You know, because you got about 10 years before the bugs figure it out, as we say. <laughs> and so yeah. we're always looking at better characteristics for, you know, increased productivity, increased profitability, decrease disease pressure, mm -hmm. and also now trying to grow cane a little further north. We're losing a lot of our cane acreage south of the interstate due to 
subdivisions. Okay. And industrial development. Yeah. And so that's why you're starting to see cane grown, and we're growing it as, as far as Bunky. But you don't get much further than Bunky, Alexandria, that area, that latitude, because of this not of the cold. Right. Right. And so developing a cold tolerant uh, sugar will allow us to move that into further north into those croplands along the Mississippi River, that very, very, very rich and fertile soil. And Commissioner Mike Strain's our guest. Uh, Dr. Strain, I may have asked you this in the past at some point, but I, I apologize because I've forgotten the answer. When you have new varieties of sugar, does it affect the taste? Generally, no. Uh, now, I like uh, molasses. I like turbinata sugar. I like the raw sh- I really yeah. love, right? Excuse me. So oh, good. Um, most of the sugar is refined into white sugar. So mm-hmm. it's it's very, very well refined. Now, we are cognizant of taste and flavor. So we're, they're not going to develop something that, that you wouldn't recognize as sugar, as you know, as sucrose. Okay. And so, but it would, it could affect that turbinata or that raw sugar flavor a little bit. Yes. Okay. And so, but, but again, we're always looking for, you know, those new varieties or something that would taste better in the brown because... You know, whenever I'm at a mill, I get a bag of some, they'll give me a bag of brown sugar and, you know, I can use that in my coffee for quite a while Mm -hmm. or for cooking. But when I, if I'm doing baking, I like to get the brown sugar and you can get that at your grocery store. You can buy a box of Domino brown sugar. It's got all the flavors. So next time, you know, if you have a choice, get some, get some brown sugar, you know, or turbinata sugar and taste it. Taste that. I love molasses. Yeah. You know, and of course, you know, my family, we always made cane syrup. Oh. And, you, and, and of course, there's nothing like fresh homemade cane syrup. Or if not, you can you get some steams, steams or some other steams. I was it's, raised on steams. You raised on steams. You know, and my grand uncle always uh, it, provided us with cane syrup. He had a small cane mill, small on the farm. And uh, I can remember the, the the vats where we would cook. There's an old sugar cane kettle on at my mom's house. Yep. You know, and so you know we were raised on that. But I love that flavor. And if you can take, for instance, you take some some Steens syrup, or you take some cane syrup, and you cook some pork chops, and right when they're done, you put that cane syrup on top, mm-hmm. and then you kind of just caramelize that, right? You just kind of candy that a little bit. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Are oh, your sweet potatoes? You take fresh Louisiana, Louisiana sweet potatoes. Okay, now you got to have some RB. You know what RB is? No. Real butter. Oh, You got to have some real butter, right? You, you Say you got that, right? <laughs> you take did. that real butter and you get, you know, some of that good cane syrup on there. It, look, it's incredible. So, yeah, Steens is a game changer. Right? As you're mentioning uh, the pure cane syrup, I'm, I'm feeling uh, like I'm not doing my job as a Louisiana because I don't think my kids have ever had it. Oh, my goodness. I know. I was raised on it, and I don't think my kids have ever had it. I can remember the Farm Bureau used to put on a legislative supper in Tangible Parish. There'd be three or 400 people there. Mm-hmm. The governor would come. Everybody would come. And it would be sausage, biscuits, and cane syrup. Oh, just in- incredible. And, you know, and the ladies, there, they made the biscuits there, you know, and it was wonderful. The local sausage and, of course, local cane syrup and a lot of real butter. You can believe in Tangible Parish. It was real butter. And I remember the first time I went, I said, my goodness, I have forgotten what this tastes like. Do we have Louisiana butter? Uh, well, yeah, some, yes. Okay. Yes. I, yes. I never, a I little never bit. see it out. A no. little bit, but uh, we're not a really big. Most of our milk goes into fluid milk uh-huh. production. But there's a lot of local entities making butter, yogurt, cheesecakes, mm-hmm. you know, Creole cream cheese by the Mote family. Yeah. So look for those certified Louisiana products. But most of our milk goes into fluid milk. Okay. Yeah, because I've never. Because we're I've a never... deficit state. I've never noticed it in the store before and never, you know, we always get the, uh, what's the Irish one, the Kerrygold? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's just. Or Orlando Lakes or one of those, mm-hmm. something really good. But but again, we import now probably 75 to 80% of the milk into the state. Wow. Yes. Okay. We only have about 50 operating dairy farms. Is that that's a significant a whole, drop off? That's a, a huge drop off. You know, when I was in private practice, I had 18 dairies in my practice. Yeah. You know, if you go back 20 years, there were probably 1,500 dairies in the Florida parishes. Mm-hmm. They were small, local delivery. Yeah. And so now, you know, the price of milk is set by the federal government, federal mm-hmm. milk marketing order. And so, and then because of the interstate system and now just the, the, the scale and size of the farms in the Midwest and the, and the fact that in, in most quarters, the cost of production of milk for Louisiana farmers is higher than the amount they receive for their milk. So in the long term, you know, mm-hmm. it'll cover most of their variable costs, feed costs, et cetera. But in the long term, it doesn't 
cover everything, and that's why when a dairy farmer goes out, generally speaking, it goes away. And we're down to 50. Two years ago, we had about 85. Two years ago? That Two recent? Ago. That recent, yes. Unbelievable. Yes. Hey, um, I know I ask you this every time. Can you stick around for a second segment? Absolutely. Excellent. Uh, we still got two minutes to go in this segment, but I just want to get that out there right now because <laughs> we have not yet talked about eggs. Um, no, yeah, I, the incredible I, I remember, edible egg. Darn right. The, you, you saw that armored truck go by a few minutes, egg right? Is more, yeah, right? Yeah, you know what was in it, huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> grade but, A brown eggs was yeah. in that armored truck. Yeah, I think we're all switching to Fabergé eggs for the cost cut. Yeah, I don't think the czar paid that much for them. Huh? <laughs> no, <laughs> we're, we're about on par. Um, I, go, going back to the dairy farms, I remember there was one up Old Military Road. In Covington, now I can't, for the life of me, I'm just firing on camera. Well, if, it, normally, if you would go up Highway 25, there were dairies all along that Chifuncta River. Mm -hmm. You know, you had the, you know, the of the core family, you had the Thompson families. Mm -hmm. There you go up, you have the Motes. There were a lot of dairies there. And the most magnificent, beautiful country and those dairy farms. You know, I went to high school with a lot of families that were in the dairy business. Yeah, yeah. We got Ed Commissioner Mike Schrainen. Uh We're going to have to break. Uh, so we'll break, we'll check news. We'll check traffic. Uh, we'll uh, reset the weather as the storms roll through Baton Rouge uh, within the last hour. Then we're going to talk about the price of eggs. I mean, there it is. I it it's not as bad here as it is in some places around the like country. California. Yeah, right. It's, yeah. So right. why you buy why? them one at a time in California? <laughs> it's, it's an omelet. Forget <laughs> it. You got to take out a second mortgage. We'll got, dive into that and a few other topics as Ag Commissioner Mike Strain uh, will continue with us right after we check news. Hey, uh, don't forget, all the content is, uh, from the show is available on demand at talk1073.com. And, of course, uh, this segment, as a number of others, will be available in the mornings with Brian Haldane YouTube channel. Here comes ABC News. We'll continue next right here on Talk 107.3 FM. Right. We're still going on Facebook. Got it. So, yeah. Um, a second or third? They're everywhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we used to put the steens on the biscuits. And I just, yes. just I mean. Gotta make it. So people need to get back to, to cooking from scratch, eating from scratch. You know, and then when you do that, when you do that, you realize how good it is. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like for me, you know, I like to go home, go out in the garden and harvest either broccoli, cauliflower or greens. Right. Bring it into the kitchen, wash it up and cook it yeah. right there. And it's got a different flavor. Or you go and get fresh corn, I mean, fresh corn on the cob, you know, right out of the field. Now, we do have a freezer full, you know, that my brother, because my brother's, you know, he's big time in the gardening. Okay. Yes. Or fresh okra, you go and cut it and bring it in, and, and that's what for supper, you know? And it's, yeah. And it's healthy. It's very good. And I love broccoli and cauliflower. And, oh, with some cheese. Got to have butter or cheese, yes. Crisp them up. Wait, put, have what chard? Broccoli, broccoli? broccoli. yeah. So or broccoli soup. You know what does it perfectly? To have just that little bit of crunchy on the outside, on the on the the uh, floral part, uh, the air fryer. <laughs> yes, yes. A lot of people are using those air fryers. Oh, it's such a time saver. You know, I use my air fryer probably four or five times a week. <laughs> Southern California, extra large eggs wholesale this week is seven thirty. Goodness gracious! Yes, you and I can tell you, uh, you saw where they were closing some of the pork facilities, the farms, and the processors in California, just shutting them down. Uh, you're going to see movement of the poultry industry out of California because electricity, water, and just political nonsense. It's not affordable. No, no, nobody. They passed a law that you couldn't build a new house. So that's why all the older houses had to, you just couldn't, there wouldn't, no more permits, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they think everything is like it should be in Los Angeles. Uh huh. Uh huh. Mm. People are moving out. 
a lot of your actors, even the ones that are work out of New York, they're moving. Yeah. They're going upstate, downstate, out of state, yeah. whatever. Yeah. New York is just kind of depopulating. Well, yeah, because yeah, the uh, the professions that used to be confined, they're not to the major hubs, the major metropolitan or the major cities are not confined there anymore. You right. can work anywhere with this if that's, you know if that's what you do. Uh, that's you that's know? why I'm going to. Yeah. Yeah. The. But you have to have the right business climate in the places to do it. Yeah. You, you mentioned Atlanta, whatever. Yeah. Well, like, yeah, Atlanta is a good example because Georgia's film tax credit. Uh huh. Just they churn out movies. So do we. And, uh, we churn out. I, we're, I have a feeling we're going to screw ourselves this year. We're going to lose the legislature. They yeah. let it expire. Yep. And we've what? seen what happened last time. All the movies went away, and all those jobs went away. They're going to go to wherever the credit is the best. Correct. Because it's a completely they're. mobile business. Uh-huh. Yes, it is. I know. I th- and more, I think more and more people turn to radio now. I mean, they are really listening to radio. And because, you know, when they're driving or, or whatever and getting back to radio. So radio and, and um, podcast. Podcast, yeah. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's so much easier than the old books on tape when you're trying to get that tape drive to work. That'd be a cassette. You know what? You know what a cassette is? That was a, yeah, yeah. When we went to eight tracks, that was wow. I still have an old eight track player. I still have an old eight track player. I don't have a DVD player. Interestingly enough, though, I'm pretty sure we have a VHS player in the attic. Yeah. No, I know for a fact we've gotten rid of all of our DVD players. I remember yeah. throwing them out. Wow. All right, so it looks like that storm has rolled through. The sun is peeking its way back out, and the sun will continue to make its way back out. Expect some cloud cover over the next couple of hours, but where we're at right now is as warm as we're going to be right now. Temperature will cool throughout the day. For example, since we're at 71 degrees right now, by about 3 p.m., that'll be 67 degrees, and on its way down to an overnight low, of about 40 before uh, before tomorrow morning. Tomorrow's high tops out at 55, Saturday at 58, Sunday at 68, and then look for rain to re-enter the forecast to begin next week. Right now, like I said, we are at 71 degrees in downtown Baton Rouge. Eight thirty six. Talk one seven three FM. WBRP. Mornings with Brian Haldane rolling right along. And Commissioner Mike Train in the house, hanging out for a second segment, so we could talk about the price of eggs. All right, Doctor Strain, what in the world is going on with the price of eggs? Are like that's the easy thing, right? Like you can live off of just eating eggs when you have no budget at all. That's right, but you you have to understand how we get to the incredible edible egg. Okay. And so when you go down and you pick up. You know, that dozen of extra large, we call those shell eggs, Mm -hmm. okay? So they're produced by hens. Now, all right, so, but now that, where did that hen come from? Another egg, right? That was produced by another set of hens. So early this year, we had another wave of avian influenza. Yes. And overall, we lost about 48 million birds. Yeah. And so if you look at overall in the egg legging population, you know, we lost about 14 to 15% of the total number of egg layers. So Because it, the birds not, refused to wear their masks. That's, that's right. Why. That's <laughs> right. Well, that and that virus, now we're better because before we lost over 100 million birds. Good. And gracious. so a number of things happened. One, we have the inflation that is affecting all aspects of American life, including agriculture. Yeah. Fuel, mm-hmm. all right, natural gas, cost of feed, cost of everything then you take on top of that now an immediate reduction in the supply and demand so it's not like you say all right we need more eggs next week well you can't go just take some eggs off you know and run them in a machine and come out on the other end and their table eggs you ha- that you know by the time you have the hen that produces the egg that produces the hen laying chicken okay mm-hmm. that go then produces that next egg that chicken itself that's laying the table egg, well, it takes at least five or six months 
for that bird to get old enough to even start laying eggs. Okay. And so there's a time factor there. And what happened, we got into November and December, which is prime baking time. You have an immediate high demand for eggs because everybody's making cookies and cakes and, you know, and eggnog and all this. And there's a shortage of eggs because of avian influenza affecting the bird population, coupled with ongoing food cost and cost of production. So if you go back two weeks, the average wholesale price, the average wholesale price in the United States was six fifty a dozen. And you know, there were eggs at eight fifty a dozen, you know, in California at nine fifty a dozen. Now it's come down this week because again now we are past Christmas and New Year's. Right. And we're not and we're not at Easter yet. We're not at Easter yet. We're trying to increase ramp up production. But if we, you know, lose those chickens that produce the egg that is then fertilized and becomes the hen lay, the hen that lays the table eggs, you know, you're looking at a significant period of time, you know, six months to eight months just to kind of ramp that production up. We're trying, but it takes time. And so now the average price, uh, for instance, in the southeast region this week is between 460 and 522 wholesale. If you look at California, the average wholesale price for extra large egg is seven dollars and forty cents. That's a insane. dozen, a dozen, and it eggs right now are not the least cost protein. You got to no. shop. You know, you could look right now, and we had a decline. Uh, all of a sudden, we had just regular chicken on the market. Dark meat. You know, we had an excess of dark meat and white meat because what happened uh, with the economy? A number of things happened. One, because the the foreign currencies got very, 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 very weak compared to the dollar. We lost some of that export market. But also, all of a sudden, you know, people after Christmas quit going to the restaurants like they were, and then you had a, a temporary a glut of, of chicken protein on the market, which drove the price of chicken breast down and dark meat down. And so, you know, right now, you, you need to be a very, very cognizant shopper, but we've got to get the price of eggs down. Because yep. when you look at, you know, when, when, when people go to the stores, you know, when mama goes making groceries, as we say, and, 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 and looks at, you know, a gallon of milk at, at 515 to 530, you look at the price of eggs, you know, at 650, and you look at, you know, a, a whole chicken between 10 and $12 for a whole chicken, that's too much. Right. That's too much to feed a family. And so one of the things we've been doing, we've been working very, very, very hard with our food banks. And the good news is uh, Foster Farms donated 400,000 pounds, 400,000 pounds. That's 10 tractor trailer loads of chicken that we distributed to the food banks over the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And so that's a that's a really good thing that, that helps the food banks are struggling to keep up. Now, the food banks serve a temporary population. So these this population is not on... The, the, the SNAP, in other words, not on what you used to be called food stamps and not on government assistance for food. Right. They're the people that's caught in the middle in the lurch. So they are working. All of a sudden, they could have lost a job or they just don't have enough money to make ends meet. They couldn't, you know, they had to pay the insurance on the house or right. fix a flat on the car. And the food banks are serving them, but they are under incredible pressure uh, to get enough product to help that community. So right now, America is struggling. And we have to work hard, and I'll be, I'll be talking at Ag Expo tomorrow. I'm at the conservation districts with our farmers today about increasing production, but we've got to get these costs down. It's, it's Commissioner, not sustainable. Ag Commissioner Mike Strain is our guest, and yeah, it, it, and that's and honestly, that's the challenge of every industry right now, though. Every industry, and what we're finding, uh, if if you look and if you read all the economic journals, people are pulling money out of the banks. At about 250, 300 billion per quarter in the United States, they're taking money out of savings. Why? Because they can't make ends meet on the income that they have. Mm -hmm. And so this economic recession, it is real. And at some point, we're going to run out of money to pull out of savings accounts and bank accounts and 401ks and all that. And we've got to get this under control before that happens. And it starts off, we've got to get the price of energy under control. Mm -hmm. We've got to, you know, we've got to drill and the good news is there were some articles talking about there's been a resurgence in exploration, development, and drilling for oil and gas in Louisiana onshore and offshore. Mm -hmm. So that's good. We need to get the energy prices down. we got to keep natural gas prices very reasonable so we can get ammonium nitrate. 
We got to fix these supply chain issues. We got to get people back to work, to making you know all those the John Deere's and the Case IHs, you know, and the Fords, all the different you know tractors and equipment that we use, and so that at the end of the day we can have reasonability uh, for America. And what's going to happen? I don't think that in the next six months to a year you're going to see a significant decrease in food costs. We've got to increase. We got to earn our way forward. You know, a lot of times when these prices hit. You know, they may come down supply and demand to a degree, but... But they never go back all they, the way. N- no, but so when you, if you buy a steak today, if you buy some ground meat today, mm-hmm. think about when those costs started. It, it didn't start when you went down to the grocery store. It started when that farmer planted the corn and the beans the year before. Right. That we then fed to that animal, you know, for three to four months. Mm-hmm. And that animal at that time, right was, you know, you look at six to eight months, you know, for that animal to be raised. What I'm saying is it takes a year to two years from if you cut the cost down at the beginning to right. get the cost down at the end. And then here comes the hard part is because it, we can either ride it out and wait for the cost to readjust or, or wait but, for the cost but, to go back, or the government can intervene and in turn just unintentionally exacerbate the situation and repeat the cycle. Yes, and so, you know, I think we've got to look at different monetary policy. We've got to be energy dominant in the world. We've got to produce enough energy to all bring down that core cost. All starts yeah. with energy. We've got to get people back to work. We've got to quit printing money. We've got to get these interest rates going back down. You know, we're seeing people going to have mortgage rates 8 to 9%. And if you're on a variable rate mortgage, that's a big deal. Yeah, it is. So your interest is tripled from what it was two years ago. And interest rate, interest Average farmer has a operating loan of one and a half to two million dollars. Operating loan each year. That's their input cost, and that's on interest. So we've got to change some fundamental policy. We got to earn our way forward. Yeah. You know, we are not going to be able to squeeze our way forward, and so we've got to get out of this forced recession, and then we have to let, earn our way forward because again, food cost, insurance cost, fuel cost you know, cost of vehicles, all these sorts of things, is really, we've been riding this out long enough, and it's time to get back to basics. Got a couple minutes left with Ag Commissioner Mike Strain. Can we get a sneak preview of what crawfish season is going to look like? It's going to be good. Uh, you know, we had that little bit of freeze, and mm-hmm. so, but it wasn't, you know, cold enough to, you know, to kill any crawfish. So, they you know, they went back in their burrows, and they came out. Now, we had some of the vegetative uh, stuff that they eat kind of break down a little bit, but that's okay. So I think we're going to have a very good season. Looks like it's mild uh, going forward. The weather uh, may be a little shorter season, so you won't have them, you know, into the summer months maybe because by that time they may be, quote, fished out. But I think they're going to be really, really, really nice. And so I'm looking forward to it. So crawfish, Louisiana crawfish. Yes. As with some Louisiana sweet potatoes in there. A little, <laughs> a little local corn, right? Don't throw in your mushrooms and your onions, some sausage, right? And everything, oh, yeah, it's time. I'm ready. And Louisiana strawberries. you got to have that afterwards. So well, the Louisiana strawberries are on, what, when is it, about March or so? They'll start in March, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and yes. March and on into April. It's uh, I, There's nothing like them. I, uh, we, they, they are so much better. Mm-hmm. You know, if you take the California berries and Louisiana berries, you cut them side by side, you see that California berry. It's a great big old berry with a little red around the rim, right? Yeah. And those Louisiana berries, they're red, they're all, red the all the way oh, through. Oh, I know. Full of know. flavor, yes. They're, they're, they're smaller, to be sure. Uh, that's okay. Uh, but that tells well, me that we're growing the original strawberry is small. Yeah. The old, original strawberry that was planted and raised on pine straw mm-hmm. is small. Yes. You know, and they are just delicious. It's another one I was raised on. We get them by the flat. You know, uh-huh. We get them by the flat right. with, the, with the little green plastic, with those little green plastic Absolutely. baskets that were inside it. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I, that was the only way to roll. Yes, my, my old running mate, Tank Powell, and I used to bring strawberries, fresh berries to the mansion for, with Governor Mike Foster. Nice. And, you know, because so, he was from, the you know, from Ponchatoula Independence. So one day the governor calls in and said, so Mike, Tank, so let me ask you all something. So what's that? How many pints come in a flat? I said, well, what do you mean, Governor? He said, every time I get them, I open up and there's two pints missing. <laughs> and big, and tank, Brother Tank said, well, you know, Governor, it's a long way from Ponchatoula to Baton Rouge. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> Yeah, see, yeah, strawberry season is on its way. We do our best to uh, hold out on crawfish until February. Because they're available right now. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so I think we're going to have a good season. I had a, a group of crawfish farmers in my office already, you know, this week talking about everything. So we're excited. We Size-wise, really they, 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 they're going to sound good, but price-wise, where are we at? Yeah, well, so price-wise, 
early in the season, they're higher. And then when you get, you know, Easter, you know, that's probably where we have the most consumption Mm -hmm. in the two weeks going up to Easter. Then right after Easter, they go down. So it's supply and demand. Yeah. So it'll, it'll be, it'll be variable. Either way, it's cheaper than eggs. Yes. (laughs) Yes. I tell you what, so like you said, maybe we'll buy some Fabergé eggs that are cheaper, right? Fab- Fabergé is cheaper than a but, dozen But look, we have large. some very good egg farms here. Uh, you know, Jordan Eggs and Cow Main Farms, they're doing very good. They're working very hard. And they, too, you know, have donated eggs in the past, you know, for the food banks. So they're good partners, uh, but we're going to do everything we can to get the price of these eggs down. But it all goes back. We've, we're working to control avian influenza, mm-hmm. and that disease is changing. And it's something that we have to be cognizant of. And, you know, high biosecurity. So that's one of the things that keeps me up at night, you know, is, the, is you know, one these avian yeah. influenza and other diseases. He is Head Commissioner Mike Strain. We always appreciate the time. And it's always a blast. It's always informative. It uh, always goes down a few paths we weren't expecting as well. Oh, wait. Hey, before you get out of here, am I going to be able to get this in in 30 seconds? You brought us some honey. Yes. Strain Farms. Uh, that's for my bees. I'm a beekeeper. Uh-huh. And so that, as you can see, it's very, very, has that yellow tinge. And so that is, you know, from mustard greens. Oh. Uh, that's what that hive fed on, so the pollen. So you can taste the mustard greens in that honey. You can taste, you the, can what, taste the, the, what the bees were Absolutely. feeding on. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, if you ever go by my farm and say, man, why doesn't he cut that grass in the back? Well, because it's got flowers. Yeah. You know, and so, yeah, I, I'm really into that. I also am the state's chief regulator of bees. I'm over the— I didn't know that's that. That's right. We have an apiary division— Bees are big business. Bees are necessary for agriculture. And it's, look, it, and it's been a very big learning curve for me. I've been in the bee business about five years. Okay. I've learned a lot. I really like my bees. You know, we get along very, very well. And I can tell you, you can go out in my garden. And yeah. if you look at my broccoli, you say, man, why is those, that broccoli, why is the head yellow? You look down, it's covered with bees. You can right. hear them pollinating and fertilizing, hear them in the cornfields. You know, and so we get along very well. I feed them very well. I take care of them, and I love making honey. He has a great relationship with his bees. He is Head Commissioner <laughs> Mike Strain. We always appreciate the time, man. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Absolutely. we got to take a quick break. Uh, yes, we missed your money now. No, I don't care. Uh, we'll take a break. We'll check traffic one more time. Coming back. Close it out next on Talk 107.3. My bees know me. I know my bees. They like me. They don't like my wife. They don't like my brother. They don't like your wife? <laughs> no, because she was cutting grass. Oh. And she hit the beehives with them. After, and, and they chased her like a block. Oh, my gosh. Bees know you. So I, go, I talk to them. Yeah. I bring them treats. Yeah. You know, they love I bring them bee biscuits. And it's like little it's pollen awesome. biscuits. And I put it and I tell them, look, this is Uncle Mike. Love. So when I give them, when I feed them, uh-huh. when I feed them, this is Uncle Mike. Look, I'm here. I'm your friend. You know, and I'll feed them. I'll lift the lid. I'll talk to them. Do you, you know? badmouth your wife to them just to reinforce the relationship? Oh, no. Okay. No, no, no. She don't mess with them. No, do you, like, tell the bees, like, I'm not like her. <laughs> yeah. Forget her. Oh, no. no, no I'm, I'm the very good guy. careful when I cut grass around the beehive. Yeah. I do it right at dark. You know, okay. and just keep them, keep them calm. Yeah, because when they're less active. And one thing I find when we're balling crawfish, bees don't like craw- it, you, they, don't. they don't like that, that pepper because yeah. they swarm. They come out of those hives. Yeah, and it's probably... 50, 70 yards away from where we, yeah, I know, but it's a lot of fun. That sounds fun. It does. I've got enough bees now to where it's getting past being a hobby. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, it's starting to be almost like work, (laughs) but I'm buying better equipment, mechanized equipment. Oh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got a hand centrifuge. You know, so you take, yeah, what happens, you take, you know, you think of the racks where where the honey's, you know, right there. And you have to put them in a hand centrifuge after you cut the wax caps off. Okay. And centrifuge it by hand and then filter it by hand. So my next purchase is going to be a mechanized centrifuge. Mm-hmm. You'll ramp it up. Oh, you, what? Yes. That's... Yes, 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 yes. But you can't get them right now. I've been trying to buy one for several months. They're unavailable. Yes. So everything, yeah. So when you see it, if you want it, you better get it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Don't wait. Well, thank you. I'll see y'all next month. Yes, right. sir. Absolutely. <laughs> tell my daughters, when you coming home, babe, we got bees to do. I love it. I think I'd be too scared. No. Well, Could see? you see me in a bee No, 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 wait, wait. That's what you can't do. They, Don't be scared. No, they know that. They sense fear? They sense your fear, mode. Yeah. 
Oh, absolutely. <laughs> just be super chill. Yeah, that's what you got to be. Yeah. You just got to be calm. And whatever you do, don't don't do start that. doing this. Don't start swatting. Be they don't like oh that. Gosh. Oh no. Yeah, just go like let them. Yeah. Yeah, just stay calm. Just stay calm. See, and I rarely, I rarely ever smoke my booze. I don't like. I just. Really? Stung by it? Oh yeah. Yeah, I learned the first lesson of beekeeping: never buy a cheap bee suit. That's fair. That would make good sense. And, they, and don't buy. That makes clothes. really good sense. <laughs> Mike. Yeah. And look at and, look at, and, and watch the, the different things on bees. It would be on the crawfish tails and crop tops, right? Bees. Yes. And because I've done several, several uh, videos. Where about in Abita? Uh, if you go from Abita Springs towards Pearl River. Yeah. The, the first, that's one farm, and it's on the right. When you leave Abita Springs, you see a long board fence. And that's so, Abita Springs towards Pro over you, you, Highway 36. Yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah. So yeah, right when you when you leave the city limits of Abita, mm -hmm. you're at my farm. Okay. Can't miss it. Okay. I'm the only one there. And it's a, that's... it is 14 mile drive. Is that by that new like athletic facility they just built? Oh, I, yeah. I don't know how new that facility is, but oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, my Finn Park, yes. Yeah, that's the I've one. We played the basketball then. there. Carrie played basketball then not long not really? long ago. Well, if you yeah, keep going have... to the right, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, you'll hit my farm. All right, cool. Can't miss it. Yeah. It's an hour and 10 minute drive. It is. 